so let me talk a little bit about, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about monolith and, and methane pyrolysis in general. Um, this is kind of the, the I'd say the, the less understood way of producing hydrogen with a low or zero CO2 um, uh, profile. And so I'll, I'll talk about it in general, but, uh, and then I'll talk just, you know, our view of hydrogen and, and the role it'll play in the energy transition. I don't think, I don't think I'm looking for converts here. I think everybody's on this because they are thinking the same way about hydrogen. And then I'll talk a little bit about the commercial operations we have in the company. So Monolith's vision is to build the world's leading renewable hydrogen and clean materials company. And we do it with a methane pyrolysis technology. Um, so the, the image here is our plant operating in Nebraska. Uh, this plant takes in renewable electricity and natural gas, and a portion of that natural gas can be renewable. Uh, right now we're taking in a portion of that as, as, as landfill gas, and that actually makes our carbon footprint absolute zero. Um, we take in those two things and we produce two products. We produce hydrogen and we produce solid carbon. And this is the lowest cost way to produce CO2 free hydrogen in the world. Um, so uh, the, uh, if, if we look at um, the way we would break this down uh, and you look at the different sort of colors of hydrogen that the world has decided to, to label hydrogen, we have, we have gray hydrogen, which is steam methane reforming. And that produces around 11 tons of CO2 per ton of uh, hydrogen. And that, that tends to be sort of all in, including methane leakage at the wellhead and other things. And then you move into blue hydrogen. And blue hydrogen is you know, basically that same thing, steam methane reforming, but with carbon capture. And traditionally, you can capture the carbon that comes out of the process side. And then there's a flue gas CO2 stream that's a little bit harder to capture. Um, there are ways that people are working on capturing more and more of that CO2 out of the flue gas. And so the, the height of that blue bar is, is a bit variable. At the end of the day, you also have the challenge around, um, you know, the methane slippage at the wellhead. But I think, you know, right now we sort of peg that at about three tons of CO2 per ton of hydrogen. The opportunity is to take that a little bit lower. Um, if we move over into the various forms of, of low CO2 hydrogen, um, and let me go back. I'm not sure why my why my slides are are moving forward, but I'll I'll try to keep them centered. Um, if we move over and we we have uh, pyrolysis, which which I, I believe many people have labeled as turquoise hydrogen. You know, our view is we we can call that green hydrogen as well as we can call electrolysis hydro green hydrogen, but let, let's call it turquoise for now. Um, pyrolysis has a very low CO2 footprint relative to hydrogen, around half a ton of CO2. Uh, per ton of hydrogen. Electrolysis is obviously zero if you use renewables. And then pyrolysis, if you actually feed in renewable natural gas, becomes negative. You actually have a negative CO2 footprint per ton of hydrogen produced. And you can see by that that by the percentage of renewable natural gas that I use, I can land at exactly zero or I can land a little bit above or a little bit below. And so depending on the carbon footprint that your customer wants for their hydrogen, you can basically meet that. And it's not free because renewable natural gas is more expensive than normal natural gas, but we have a lot of capabilities to, to move that around based on the market and the customer for the hydrogen. Uh, a little bit, just the history of this company. We founded Monolith Materials in Silicon Valley in 2013. Uh, we raised capital from two large private equity funds, Warburg Pincus and Azimuth Capital. Um, and then we built a demonstration facility. And the demonstration facility was about a $10 million plant with a one megawatt uh, electric arc system. And we basically proved the yield rates. We have a first pass yield that's nearly 98% converting methane into hydrogen and solid carbon. And we also proved that we could produce carbon materials that would have value on the market. And that was you know, the operational stability, the yield rate and the value of the carbon were the key things to do. Once we did that, we raised a large growth round and we moved the company to Nebraska, where you can see we built this, this uh, commercial facility called the Olive Creek One plant. Um, that plant is now operating. I'll go into more details there. And now we're doing the engineering work to expand that plant. This plant is a single furnace. The plan is to expand that into 12 furnaces over the next two to three years. So 
just briefly to talk about hydrogen and why everybody's looking at it and our view on that. Um, obviously, there you know there's there's great things that can be done with renewable power to re replace fossil power, um, but at the end of the day, only thirty percent of the world's CO two comes from power generation. The rest of it comes from transportation, from industry, from building heating, from chemicals, from cement, from all these other things. And hydrogen is sort of the key that unlocks all of those. Um, you know, hydrogen for heat, hydrogen for chemistry, hydrogen for fuel in and of itself, and hydrogen as an ingredient into other sustainable fuels. And so, you know, we see this massive hydrogen market that is growing dramatically. Um, and you can see, you know, this, this chart tracks the growth of the hydrogen market, and it's doubled in the last 25 years. And that's actually pretty slow growth. That's about a 3% annual growth. It's now growing at about 7% per year. It's expected to go up nearly five to six times over the next 30 years. So the big question is, where is all this hydrogen going to come from? And if it's all from electrolysis, that is a lot of electrical capacity, a lot of electrical grid. The, the fantastic thing about pyrolysis is that from a theoretical basis, it takes about seven times less energy, less electricity to split hydrogen out of methane as it does out of water. Now, if you're in North America, like we are, where natural gas is very, very low cost, it's a far more uh, cost-effective way to produce hydrogen than it is uh, producing it from water, even with our low-cost renewable power. If you're in Europe, it's a little bit different because in Europe, natural gas does not have the same low price it has in North America, so you have to be cognizant of that. But to, in today's market, with renewable prices being what they are and the dominant form of renewable energy looking to be offshore wind in, in Northern Europe, we still believe that methane pyrolysis has a, has a key role to play in the European hydrogen market as well. Um, in Asia, uh, pyrolysis is very advantaged because you know if you look at Japan or Korea, where they don't have much land and they don't have great renewable power resources, renewable power is very expensive. And so if you're gonna try to make hydrogen via electrolysis in Japan, you're talking about $6,000 a ton. And even though you're shipping natural gas over as LNG, Pyrolysis is a much more advantaged way to produce hydrogen. So just talk briefly about commercial operations. This facility was constructed in uh, last summer. Uh, it's operating today. It's producing hydrogen every day. It's running at about 80% capacity now. And we're working on a few more heat integration uh, uh, components to get up to 100% capacity. It's producing carbon black that's on spec for use in rubber and tires and plastic. And it is cons by considerable margin, the world's largest CO2 free hydrogen production plant. Our plan is to expand this facility. So today this is a single furnace operating, producing 15,000 tons per year of carbon and 5,000 tons per year of hydrogen. Our plan is to expand that and build 12 more furnaces, get up to about 180,000 tons per year of carbon and 60,000 tons per year of hydrogen. There's no technology scale up required because we're simply building more of the same furnace. Um, we have, the technology is proven. We're, we're wrapping up the feed study and we have a major, uh, we have a, a major EPC company as a partner, which is Kiwit. I'm looking forward to building this plant and future plants with them as a partner. Um, just thinking about the end markets, if you're producing hydrogen in the Midwest of the United States, where you know much of the world's corn is grown, the, the best thing to do with your hydrogen is convert it into ammonia. And so what we will do with this facility is we'll put a Haber-Bosch loop on the back end and we'll produce ammonia from this hydrogen stream. Um, and, and you know, I, I, I think most people know about ammonia, but basically ammonia-based fertilizer is responsible for feeding about half of the world. Um, and you can't really talk about green ammonia or clean ammonia without talking about hydrogen because hydrogen accounts for 90% of the CO2 footprint of ammonia. And so this is a method that we can produce CO2 free ammonia, but do it at competitive prices because ammonia is a liquid. You have to produce competitively on the global scale or you start to have challenges. And I know in, in Europe, they're talking about sort of border tariffs around CO2 footprint. We don't have that yet in the United States. And so, you know, we obviously will be looking for ways that we can, we can sell our ammonia at a premium, but Monolith's facility will be able to sell ammonia at competitive prices, no CO2 footprint, 
and, and, and be competitive in the general market. And then on the other side of the coin, we convert the hydrogen to ammonia, we'll, we'll sell the carbon black into rubber and plastics businesses. And just, just a little bit about this, and, and I think Gerard hit on this, carbon soot does not make carbon black. Carbon black is actually a specialized nanoparticle that requires a lot of tuning, and it takes two to three years for customers to take it, test it, and confirm that it works in their formulas. Um, this is one of the key bits of intellectual property for Monolith, is that we've figured out how to make high-value, high-performing carbon black from a methane pyrolysis system. Um, it's challenging. And so, you know, when we sort of walk through what we're going to sell it for, this is not theoretical. We actually just will be announcing a major offtake contract with one of the world's largest uh, tire production companies. Um, this is, you know, very critical to being able to sell the hydrogen at a competitive price is being able to sell the carbon for also for value. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll sort of stop there and, and take any questions.